If you've listened to ZZ Top, if you know of Gary Lewis and the Playboys, if you have heard of Chili's Baby Back Ribs, then you are aware of Robin Hood's work. For going on 60 years, Robin Hood Brines has been running Robin Hood Studios in Tyler, seeing all kinds and types of musicians, as well as working in advertising and TV recording. In this interview, we go over his incredible career, whether working for Coors Brewing Company or recording four of the most legendary Texas albums of all time, Robin Hood has an amazing story to tell. So I hope you will step into the studio with me as we meet Robin Hood. Well, I'm sitting here in uh, Robin Hood Studios with Robin Hood himself, and uh, he's a man who's recorded probably... Uh, Four of the biggest Texas albums, uh, most legendary Texas albums yeah. of all time. And uh, I'm sure he's done a lot more than that. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself real quick. Well, thank you very much, Isaac. Uh, yeah, I was um, I was interested in music way back when, but I was taking classical piano lessons. I didn't care for those. So in the ninth <laughs> grade, I told my mother, I said, I'm not going back. You can whip me, you can beat me, you can ground me. I'm just not going back. So she said, well, if you're not going to practice, then we won't spend the money. Well, and then I just started playing what I wanted to play on the piano, just trying to pick out things by ear. And uh, 1957, Jerry Lee Lewis put out a record called Whole Lot of Shaking. <laughs> and I heard that, I said, I'm going to learn how to do that. And sure enough... I did, and not long after that, he came to Tyler and played at the old Mayfair Club out there. And since I knew all the guys at the radio station, I said, you want me to be their tour guide? Well, yeah, sure. So I got to, to ride to Gregg County with them to show where to go to get beer back then. <laughs> and uh, uh, I got to go up into their hotel room at the old Blackstone Hotel, and there was a piano in the room. And Jerry Lewis, was, Jerry Lee was playing, and boy, first I just watched that left hand. Uh, uh-huh, okay, that's how you do that. It's kind of like a karate chop. And then I watched his right hand, and uh, that was up close and personal. And then I went out and, and took pictures at the Mayfair Club. So I went to work, and I learned how to play piano like that, and I wrote a song called Dis a It a Bit. Is it a bit of loving it all you get tonight? Yeah. And ended up signing a contract with Fraternity Records out of Cincinnati. They were one of the, the fairly good size, uh, you know, independent labels at the time. Harry Carlson, who ran it, had been with Decca, and he branched off and put in his own label. Um, you know, they had the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra and Lonnie Mack and uh, various artists, and... They took me to Nashville, and I recorded in the original Owen Bradley Studios. And if some people out there are thinking about the Quonset Hut, uh-uh. <laughs> You're on the wrong page. It was downstairs in this old house on 16th Avenue South. What they had done is they cut out the floor of the living room and dining room mm -hmm. and went down and finished the basement so they'd have really high ceilings, which you need for a studio. And uh, so they they uh, just had a little, literally a little corner of the room cut off. That's where the word booth came from. We have control rooms now. Yeah. Sometimes control rooms, you know, are big as this in major studios. But it was literally a booth, just big enough for the recorder and a little mixer and three guys to stand. And I recorded my songs. And when I came home, I told my parents, that's it. That's what I want. I want a studio. So it started with portable equipment going around into church basements. And the, we had an old woman's building here that had a great chickering uh, piano on stage. And I would go there, take my equipment. And eventually I started recording here at home. And my parents said, well, this boy's driving us crazy. We've got to have a studio. <laughs> so my sister, being an architect, designed this building. And we built it in the backyard of what was our homestead. And uh, opened up in uh, July of 1963, Robin Hood Studio. Actually, it was called Brian's Recording Studios. My last name is Brian's, yeah. B-R-I-A-N-S. Well, when people would quote it, they'd put an apostrophe before the S, and like it was Joe's Barbershop or Brian's Studios. 
So I finally gave up and, and changed the name to what everybody else called it, Robin Hood Studios. And it's been that way ever since. Uh, you know, as I look back, uh, next, next July, if I'm still kicking and having fun, um, we'll make 60 years from the day this building was built. Wow. And uh, when I talk about this building, it gets, it gets sort of personal because we hired the Haydite blocks laid. Other than that, we did it all ourselves. Mm -hmm. We did all the carpentry. We did all the plumbing, the electrical. My dad knew how to do that. We did the roofing. We did it all. So I learned how to do a lot of things I didn't want to make a living doing. You know? <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate yeah. carpentry. So uh, I want to know where did the uh, where did the name Robin Hood come from? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, my birth certificate says Robin Hood Bryan's Jr. So, so it's your actual middle name. It's actually it's actually on my birth certificate. In fact, I had a had an engineer call me from New York one time. He was wanting to know some question of how I got some certain sound. Yeah, this is Lenny from New York. Uh, uh, I'm at, uh, you know, media studios up here. I want to talk to the dude who calls himself Robin Hood. I said, this is Robin. He said, gee, where did you, where did you pick up such a crazy name? And I said, well, actually, uh, I found it on my birth certificate. <laughs> That's your real name? I said, yeah. So, you know, it, it wasn't much fun in third grade. Yeah. You know, at, during playground, everybody chase you and they want to whip your butt, you know. Yeah. But in the fourth grade, I learned how to fight, and that put an end to that. So, Well, then, uh, plus, I'm sure in the music world, especially in the 60s, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you had the well, name. <laughs> we had quite a group here. I recorded a group called Mouse and the Traps. And so we had Mouse, and, of course, the famous guitarist, Bugs Henderson, started working here at our studio. And we had a drummer named Levi Garrett at the time. So, you know, people would call down here and it would it would be, you know, like calling uh like calling Looney Tune cartoons <laughs> office yeah, or something. Yeah. Cartoon. Yeah. Man. But I started uh this studio very humbly. Uh my father died four months after the studio was finished, very suddenly mm. and unexpectedly. And you've heard the term I hit the ground running. Well, I hit the ground running scared. Yeah, because he didn't have any money at the time he died. I had no safety net. I worked without a net, and um, it was literally record anywhere, any time, any time they wanted to. I've I've had some strange clients. Uh, David Koresh, under the name of uh, Vernon Howell. That's right. Was it? He was from around here. Yeah, wasn't he was he? from Chandler out here. Yeah, and recorded a group. Uh, I had. Uh, uh, Scientologist group come down one time. Um, it was the son that brought the group down. And boy, they sent me literature for 30 years. I mean, it was just on and on and on. Um, I recorded a group from the prison as part of their uh, work release program. They were going to get, you know, sort of a halfway situation, let them record. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the prisoners that came up was the girl who called herself Candy Barr, the stripper from the Carousel Club in Dallas. Yeah. And the Carousel Club was owned by Jack Ruby, who was the one that shot Oswell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've had some, besides the stars, I've had some interesting <laughs> people some come through here. Um, but I first started out doing square dance records, uh, little local labels, individuals. Um, we had some pretty good musicians. Uh, yeah. That's that's part of what made it work, um, because in studio, if you don't have good musicians, then you know you don't really have much to bank on. Yeah. Uh, so do you have sort of studio musicians, yeah. just people who'd come yeah. in and? Yeah. Ronnie Weiss, Mouse played a lot of guitar, as did Bugs. Yeah. Uh, Levi Garrett was the drummer, and then Levi quit. He went away, sold me his drums, and left. And Levi was literally the number one rudimental drummer in America in high school. He had a metronome in his head that was just incredible. Yeah. And, you know, that was, that's your foundation. You know, the drums, that's the beat. That's the foundation. So we started bringing drummers from Dallas and Nacogdoches, Lufkin, Shreveport, any place we could find one. But we couldn't find anybody yeah. that had that groove. 
Well, one, one night, one Friday night, Rodney Camel, used to, who you work for the city, he used to throw big Friday night shows, a place called Bergfield Park out here. And I was out there visiting with some people because I'd, I'd been on it a lot of times, and I was just visiting that night. And backstage, he introduced a group from Troop, Texas, the Marauders. And I went, okay, whatever. And all of a sudden, they started playing. Some people were talking to me, and I couldn't hold their attention. I said, hold on just a minute. And I went around the corner, and all it had back then was two uh, Haydite block walls. And I just leaned up against one of those walls, took a deep breath, relaxed, started listening, closed my eyes, and I said, oh, I hope that drummer is not from North Carolina or California or something <laughs> He had the groove. Yeah. He had the groove. And after the show, I went out and introduced myself to this little bitty short red-headed kid about 15 years old. His name was Paul Lime. Uh, and I said, would you like to play on sessions? And he said, well, I've never done that before. And I said, don't worry. You've got everything you need. He said, yes, sir. These are my drums. I said, no, no, no. We have a full set of Ludwig Blue Note, which were the, the thing. Top of the then. line. Top yeah. of the line, Yeah. And I said, we change the heads regularly, and they're tuned and ready. I said, you just, all you need to do is show up. We'll teach you the rest. And so at 15, he became the staff drummer. Mm -hmm. Now, he couldn't drive a car, so his mother had to bring him. He went to the Troop High School. And, of course, we had a lot of sessions during the day on the week. And so his mother would get him a doctor's excuse <laughs> and bring him over. And her, his mother told me one time, she said, Paul has a reputation of being the sickest kid in school. They were praying for him over there because he misses so many days, you know, on these doctor's appointments. Everybody's wanting to know, you know, what's wrong with him, what's wrong with him. I yeah. said, oh, well, it's just something he'll grow out of, I think. And uh, grow out of mean get out of high school so he yeah. could, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Skip classes. The only two people who knew the truth were the band director and the principal. Yeah. Nobody else Nobody knew. Nobody else knew. Yeah. Paul uh, has become one of the greatest drummers in America. Um, he became the best drummer in Dallas. Then he went to L.A., was first call for records, first call for commercials, first call for, uh, well, John Williams. He was first call for John Williams for film scores, playing on huge tracks like, you know, Back to the Future and kind of stuff, yeah. and it was just pretty amazing. He lives in Nashville now. He was voted best drummer in Nashville, I think, three or four years in a row. So, you know, he's he's still a great friend of mine, and he's going to be the grandmaster of the Troop Texas celebration of 150 years of the founding of the city of Troop, sesquicentennial, and that's on I think October 8th, Saturday. Yeah. So. Uh, if anybody's interested, they should go check go out check the parade. It out. Yeah. But then, um, you know, I kept recording these different groups. Um, Mouse and the Traps did some wonderful stuff. Um, I, my business was split up really about half and half between Louisiana and Texas. Mm -hmm. I had two labels that were my sort of uh, every everyday customers. There was Jewel Paula Records out of Shreveport. Mm-hmm. Um, they sent me John Fred and the Playboy Band, uh, The Uniques, uh, Nat Stuckey. Uh, I did a lot of big records for people like that. And then there was Abnak Records in Dallas, uh, The Five Americans, John and Robin, The In Crowd. Um, they, they were a, a steady client. So, and then, of course, along came ZZ Top. Now, ZZ Top, when they first came here, were called the Moving Sidewalk. And I'm going to stop and get a lozenge from my throat because no, it's getting fine. dry. The first time ZZ Top came up, they were called the Moving Sidewalk. And uh, we recorded about three days, I think. And we were looking for some special sound. And I wanted to overdub because mm -hmm. I had played a trick on a record called All These Things by the Uniques. And I knew it would work. But Bill Hamm 
was a record promoter for uh, Daly Brothers record distributors out of Houston. They also owned Big State in Dallas, so they literally controlled the major record yeah. distribution in, in, in <laughs> Texas. And um, he had brought a group in for a hop in uh, San Antonio. And when they got on the stage, they didn't sound anything like their record because they'd done so much overdubbing that they couldn't produce live. Yeah. So he made himself a hard, fast rule. When I get a group to manage, there will be no overdubbing. So he brings me one bass, one guitar, and one set of drums. And I'm thinking, you know. Now, Billy wanted to do some overdubs because I told him what I wanted to do, but Bill wouldn't have So that they went home, threw away all of that. Um, and then it was a while. I don't remember how long it was before they came back. But when they came back, they said... Uh, We've changed our name to ZZ Top. To this day, they deny it was because Zigzag and Top were the prevalent rapping papers rapping. for weed in those <laughs> days. But, you know, yeah, that's their story, and they're sticking with it, so we're not going to argue with them. Uh, <clears throat> so they came back as ZZ Top, and, you know, once again, it was fighting to try to find that sound. Yeah. I put microphones outside the drum booth. I put the microphone out in the entrance hall. I put it up aimed at the, some wood and the ceiling and added that. I mean, I did everything I could to try to make the sound different. And, you know, back in those days, there were no stomp boxes. Yeah. If you wanted a sound, you had to figure out a way to create it. Yeah. And so... Uh, Reminds me of a story of a guy had a studio down in Louisiana. He wanted slapback. Well, nothing produced a slapback but tape, but it wasn't the right speed uh, mm -hmm. for the song. So he, he had a studio out in the country, so he put the amp outside, put the mic there, and then they kept moving the second mic until it was Farther the right the distance. <laughs> yeah, uh, the few cars going by, but other than that, it was a pretty yeah. good slapback sound. So we kept on and on, and, and the third time they came back, uh, I, I put together a little plan. I told Bill, I said, you, you know, you've been promising these guys you're going to get them ribs from the country tavern. Today should be the day. He said, okay. So I told Billy what I was going to do, and my mama finally called him in there about 1 o'clock and said, you want to call and pay in advance so they'll be ready for you? Oh, yeah. Well, the country tavern doesn't require that. Yeah, but I told him that they did because I didn't want. I knew <laughs> he wouldn't want leave around. all those ribs paid for over there because I didn't tell him how far it was. Yeah, and so when he said, "Okay, where is this place?" I said, "Well, you go down Vine Street to Front Street, turn right. That turns into Highway 31, or mm, yeah, th 31. Uh, that was 64. I told him to, to get over, turn on, right on 31 off the loop." And I said, it's called the Country Tavern. It's on the left. It's quite a ways out there. Don't, if you get lost, just ask. Everybody knows where it is. Yeah. Well, an hour and 35 minutes <laughs> later, he shows up with all these ribs and said, you didn't tell me the damn place was in the next county. And I said, well, seems like around the corner because we go there all the time, you know. Well, what I had done is I got them in the studio and recorded a basic track. And I told Billy, play your rhythm as simple as possible. Because mm -hmm. you're going to have to double it. Sure enough, he did. Now, the two other guys went in and watched television, and I just came out and just screwed up the tuning a little bit on his strings. I said, now, double that rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I did. And when he heard it in the headphones, he just went, I said, yeah, that's it. So we panned those 45 degrees, and then he put a slide lead on top. And when Bill came back, He's sitting there by the recorder, and he said, Bill, I think we found the sound we're looking for. It's different. It's really cool. Check this out. He reached over and pushed play on the recorder. And when it started, Bill went, wow, how'd you do that? And I said, oh, we pulled a little natural kind of trick on it. And he kept listening. He said, that's, that's wonderful. I, lo I love that. I love that. 
So Dusty said, well, you want us to do all songs with that kind of sound? He said, well, of course. It's wonderful. Yeah. How, how did you get it? He stopped the recorder, and I said, Bill, we did just a little bit of overdubbing. Oh, you can't overdub. I said, Bill, <laughs> you have one guitar. Yeah. In the studio, we're going to overdub. You make up for the difference in the stadium by cranking the amp up. But And I said, while, while Billy is playing, when you go live, when Billy is playing the lead, Dusty plays fifths on the bass, which fills in the harmony. Yeah. The distortion in the amp will create the tenth, and that's the third, and I said, that's cool. It'll work. <laughs> and that's the way we recorded their sound. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> One of the most interesting groups I ever recorded was John Fred and the Playboy Band. Um, they were a good band. Most of them came out of the uh, uh, band department of LSU mm -hmm. in Baton Rouge. And John Fred was different. Jody in the skies. I mean, I love to go back and listen to the old vocal tracks of him, just his vocal. He smacked it. Judy and the sky. Mm. Mm. That's what you are. Mm. 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 You know. Yeah. And you don't hear it on the record because it's on the beat, but, but you know, it's kind of strange. If you In fact, just have that uh, vocal track. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's really weird. But he was talented. He he he's thought outside the box. Mm -hmm. I think psychologists would say he had trouble coloring between the lines. But anyway, it was it was interesting. It was, the funny thing about it, though, they they put out a song called Agnes English, and they released the whole album, which contained a song called Up and Down. It had Judy in Disguise on it and a bunch of other good songs. And we were recording some more tunes, and my mother came in and said, uh, it's the label. They want to talk to John Fred. So I got on the talk back. I said, hey, Fred, you got a phone call from Threeport. Y'all just met. hold on a minute. So he went in there talked he came back reached over pushed the talk back button into the speakers out here and he said hey y'all 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 be quiet you want to guess what record those idiots over there have chosen for our next single and they started guessing and nobody guessed he says no judy in blankety blank disguise and they just went oh no that was a joke. That was a joke on Lucy in the Sky. With that. That's just a joke. And he said, well, that's, I argued with him, but that's going to be the next single. And Andrew Menard, the co-writer and co-producer, he's the one that wrote the charts. He played horn. and He said, well, Fred, one good thing about it, uh, it won't last but about a week and a half, and then we can release another single. And, of course, it was the hit that they had. <laughs> That record knocked the Beatles out of number one. Really? On the worldwide chart. Uh, so it's kind of amazing that they couldn't tell that that was really a cool record. Yeah. You know, but, you know, that, that was their big one. Um, one of the records that played for many years on oldies until all this, all this takeover of all the labels by the three label groups in yeah. Nashville. Uh, you know, there used to be, what, 17 labels that recorded yeah. in Nashville, major labels. I think we're down to like four or five there, in the whole country now. <laughs> there, there are three label groups. Yeah. And they own them all. Yeah. Um, I mean, they bought Dot Records, Capitol Records, Motown, big labels, just, yeah. you know, like a black hole, sucking them all up. But... Uh, Back then, a record by Joe Stampley and the Uniques called All These Things. The touch of your lips is an Aaron Neville song. Next to mine. And I had actually done that little detune trick on that record back when I only had two tracks. <laughs> that was in the very beginning. Record the band on one track, get on the second track, put Joe's lead singer, put the vocal background singers, Mm -hmm. And I had the, the rhythm guitar player. I just detuned his guitar. It was just a Stratocaster yeah. with a very clean sound. Just played that arpeggio just like it was. Do, 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 do. And it, of course, detuned a little. We call it flange or 
chorusing today, but yeah. but you know, created it naturally. It's actually kind of like a twelve string, you know, because mm-hmm. some people like to tune twelve strings with a with a second set of strings just slightly off, slightly out of yeah, tune to give a yeah. little float to it. But it's been a wild and crazy ride. Um, yeah. I, uh, you know, music went through several phases. When Acid Rock came along, my partner and I said, he was not a partner in the studio, but but we were partners in doing some production. Mm-hmm. And a guy named Randy Fouts, a very talented pianist and arranger. We kind of looked at some of the people coming in here and and uh, we said, you know, maybe we should do some commercials because it's better money. So we got into the business of doing commercials. We worked with the guy who created the original Chili's Baby Back Ribs campaign. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you can tell it was the original when you hear it because in the voiceover he said, and a full luscious rack, only six ninety nine. What are they now? Eighteen ninety nine yeah. or something? You know, <laughs> that'll tell you what time will do and inflation. But uh, you know, we did a lot of commercials for Frito Lay products, Borden products. We did work for American Airlines and Southwest Airlines, uh, Miller Light, um, Coors Light, bunch of beers. We did a we did a whole series of commercials for Lone Star Beer, and they were the most fun. Yeah. Never heard a client say, "Do us write a funny sixty-second song, and mention Lone Star Beer one time." That's it. Really? They had armadillo beauty contests, pick up stuff, stuff in contests. Uh, you know, in fact. So it just kind of gave you more freedom. Oh, we <laughs> never could, had that much freedom. Yeah, working with commercials. Yeah. Um, it's real funny because we were doing a thing for Coors. Mm-hmm. It was for Coors Light. It was going to run just Texas. And the client told me they wanted, uh, what was his name? Mm, come on, Robin, you can remember. He, uh, he, he did a lot of records, and then he got hits. He did commercials first, and then when he got his hit record, nobody could afford him. Oh, uh, Manilow? Or? No, no, it was more hard, hard voice, strong, raspy. <laughs> Shame on me for getting his name. Uh, anyway, the client told me that's the kind of voice we want, though. Mm-hmm. S- what was his name? Come on. Well, at eighty three, I can lose one name, and it's okay. <laughs> um, so I called a guy in California, and he said, uh, "I know just the guy. He's new in the business." And he said he's got that big voice, but when he goes up high, it stays big. Yeah. It's raspy. It's strong. You know, it's what you're looking for. Um, I said, okay, give me his number. So I called him, and uh, he sang over the phone, and then he sent me a tape. And when I played the tape for the client, they said, yeah, we want that guy. His name was Michael Lanning. So Michael, we flew Michael in. We had to record in Dallas because... You know, we record. I think we recorded the track here, but took the tape up there. And he flew into DFW, and we brought him over to the studio, and he sang it. And I mean, it was like turning the switch on. Yeah. You know, a lot of the local singers they kind of work it out and everything, but he had studied it because we sent him the track with me singing it and phrasing it like we wanted it. And I mean, it's like it's like turning the switch on. You know, we rolled the track, and he just nailed it. We look, producers were sitting back there. I said, well. And they went, I don't hear anything wrong with that. <laughs> he said, let me give you one more just so you have something to choose from. And I swear, you could put them side by side and you couldn't tell the difference. Do the exact same. He just, fantastic. <laughs> and uh, when he came in the control room, he was listening to it. He, uh, he acted like he was real nervous. And finally he said, uh, Judd Chapin. I think, no, Judd wasn't doing that session. That was for Tracy Locke, I think. And looked at the producer from Tracy Luck, and he said, I know this is out of order because I know you don't ever give out copies until it's released. But he said, next Thursday, I've got to play a tape for a producer, and this is exactly what I need on my demo reel because this is the kind of music, this is the best, this is the best commercial I've sung on so far. Because my partner and I, we wrote good songs. 
You know, we competed. A lot of times we had to compete with killer music in L.A. and and the the big agencies in New York that wrote top jingles, and we had to compete with them. Mm. So we had to write good stuff, and this was a good song. They looked at each other, and, and the client for Coors said, uh, will you promise me you won't play it for anybody else but that one guy? And he said, yeah. He said, Turn, he turned to the agency producer and said, this is going to be on the air in five days. He said, let him have a copy. So we gave him seven and a half copy. And I got a call back from him later. And he said, I uh, really want to thank you for this because it got me a project that's going to buy me a house. It's going to put a swimming pool in the backyard <laughs> and a new car. And a lot of older people will remember his voice. Heartbeat of America. That's today's Chevy truck. Yeah. Michael Lanning. And he's done a lot of work for us yeah. in commercials. And recently I've gotten into a, a, a lot of really different kind of recording. Um, for instance, I got a call from a, well, it actually started with emails from a production company in Germany. And they said, uh, we're shooting a live television show, uh, a cop reality show in Hawkins, Texas. <laughs> the star is the chief of police. He was born and raised in Berlin, speaks perfect German. And when he speaks English, it's kind of, y'all come on down here and we'll do this kind of thing. His name's Manfred Gilo. We just finished, they just finished the fourth so, season. So he's the actual... He's the actual chief of police. He really? was. He re, he's resigned <laughs> yeah. that, and we're going to do something else later. But this fourth season, I've been doing this. And they gave very specific program, uh, I mean specific uh, specifications about special program that I had to use to stream it to them. Because while he's out here watching the picture, listening to the English, the sound effects, and the music that they've put together, mm -hmm. He's watching the numbers count off, and when the right time comes, he's reading his lines in German. Yeah. Now, I take all of that to my laptop. I stream it to two producers at Fabiola Productions in Germany, two producers at, uh, at Discovery Channel, Germany. And they listen real time, and they watch real time, and they can talk back into his headphones right over here and direct him just like they're sitting in my control room. That has opened up a whole new world for me. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I had two sessions with two ladies that live close to here. First, uh, a group called uh, StoryCorps. Does a lot of podcasts for uh, the NPR and people like that. So they said, we've got these two ladies coming in. Uh, and I want, to, I want to warn you, they are partners. And I said, oh, they're a, they're a couple. Yeah, I said, that's not a problem. They said, and, I, and, and I'll have to tell you, the, the subject matter will be controversial. I said, lady, I, I, I'm writing a book. You, you're not even going to make that, <laughs> that chapter when it comes to controversial stuff. Yeah. And she said, well, okay. Well, they came in, and it ends up the, one of the ladies is the female lawyer that filed the original Roe v. Wade in Dallas, Texas. 50 years ago. Yeah. Now, she had suffered from some West Nile virus and was having difficulty, you know, making complete sentences because, uh, I'm, I mean, I was really hurting for her because she had to struggle to really get the answers where they could be edited together. Um, and then a few weeks later, I get a call from iHeartRadio in New York. They said, we want to record these two people, interview these two people. Katie Couric is going to do the interview. I said, okay. Well, the day comes, and here's the same two ladies. Katie Couric had to go to a doctor's appointment, so somebody else did the interview. But it's the same two ladies. Mm -hmm. uh, I just finished working on a podcast. Uh, it's about the famous, uh, in fact, the script was read from here. Uh, there was a drug rehab center in Los Angeles many years ago called Synanon. Um, it, it was the first of a kind. It, you live in, you know, it was clean you up. The, there were a lot of musicians in the group at the time because, you know, LA, 
a lot of the musicians got on heroin and things like that. Yeah. And so um, that that podcast done, done fabulously well. I ended up reading one of the parts. The Charles Dietrich, they call him Chuck, was the guy that started it. And it, it went astray. Let's mm. just say that, that it got out of hand and it all ended up being closed down. But um, it was it, it was interesting because I'd actually been in the place. I was with a group in California one time called Johnny Green and the Green Men. They dyed their hair green. <laughs> yeah, anything. Did that from, alone send them to the rehab? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They weren't in. <laughs> they might have belonged in the they rehab. They might have yeah, A couple of them at least. <laughs> but but uh, they were visiting a friend who was there. Mm -hmm. and said, would you like to go with us and we'll have lunch? I said, sure. Now, the funny thing about it is they stopped by some guy's house and they bought some designer drugs that he had created and put them in the car and then went over and visited their friend in the drug rehab center and then we had lunch. That was the 60s. Yeah. The old saying that if you remember the 60s, you weren't really there. (laughs) Uh, How much of it do you remember? Oh, I remember it all because I didn't really do drugs. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I was in the room when pot was smoked quite a few times. Now, I, I'm in my book, I've got two groups that I, I will feature in one chapter. They're both from Austin. They had more drugs than I'd ever seen with any group in my life. Yeah. One of the groups was named Oedipus and the Mothers. The other group was Shiva's headband. And I mean, they weren't afraid. Let's just say they were not afraid of anything that was a substance. Um, But they recorded some interesting stuff. They they set a guy on the floor over here. They brought him a tabla, and he sat there and played that, and they'd bring him drugs. And then he'd do a tambourine and, you know, a scraper and, and, you know, all these little percussion instruments. And he never moved. He sat right there the whole time. You know, four and a half, five hours later, they helped him up and they left. Huh. But uh, it's been wild and crazy. It's been, but of course, on the other hand, I've done some wonderful Christian records. Yeah. Um, I have a gold album on the wall in there from a group called Candle. They were with the Agape Force when the Agape Force was just up here between uh, Lindale and Mineola. Um, and I've done, you know, the Pates. Pate family from down in, uh, uh, I think they live in, in Jacksonville or below mm-hmm. here, or Rusk. And there's just been a lot of really beautiful Christian music done here. I mean, um, I was raised in the Episcopal Church, so I'm a snob, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I used to play with Tony Douglas and the Shrimpers. You're a snob who hung out with a lot of acid trippers. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, you know, um, Let's just say that I've had a very wide and varied experience with yeah. people. Uh, I was raised on Handel, Mozart, Bach, Mendelssohn, Purcell. I mean, the very finest of the finest. Mm-hmm. And um, my musical mentor then was a guy named Paul Grubb. Paul, well, he started out as a car salesman for Holly Motor Company. But he had studied at Westminster Choir School. So he was our choir director for 23 years. And Paul Grubb had the best taste in Anglican liturgical music I've ever seen. His policy was we only sing the best of the best. Yeah. Which means just because Mozart wrote it doesn't mean it's the best. We only sing his best works and only Beethoven's best work and only Bach's best work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we had a very small choir back at our church, Christ Church, back in those days. And he said, the way to make people love your music, if you sing the greatest music, they'll like it. And sure enough, they did. Mm -hmm. Um, My studio now is, uh, of course, it's it's really a paradox because a lot of my microphones are from the 60s. You come in and sing a solo, you'll be singing in the same mic Billy Gibbons and John Fred and those guys and Tina Turner sang in. But in the control room, uh, it's a combination of of vintage and the very latest stuff. Yeah, I'm putting together a package now to go and do remote recording. Um, I've got 21 channels of API 
and Neve Mike Freeze. And they're the best. So I've got those now. I've remounted out of the console into a portable case. I'll be able to take those and, what, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 worth of these Neumann mics and go live, whether it's a symphony orchestra or a school choir or a church choir or a band in a club, and I'll be able to get studio quality in a live environment. And we're not even going to have a console. We're going directly from the microphones into the mic prees, into the converter, and the, into the laptop. And all we'll have to do during the performance is sit and trim the mic prees to make sure everything stays in line. And it's called capture recording. We don't. I don't have to worry about the PA, the the monitor levels for the band, any of that. Yeah. All I'm concerned with is capturing what they do. You know, and when you've got uh, twenty thousand dollars in a pair of mics out so, so picking just, up the room mics you know just a question like so the way you're doing it is it going to s- separate each mic into a separate track yep okay 32 channels yeah so that then they can come here or go to whatever studio and they'll have every mic on a separate channel yeah and uh, i won't mess with the sound of course the old-fashioned way which is still the best is to tune the instrument like the drum, tune it till it sounds right recording. Mm-hmm. Secondly, use the right mic on the right instrument. Uh, for instance, on, on uh, hi-hat, I use what's called a, a Neumann KM85. Now, KM84 has a real flat response. The 85 starts rolling off at 220 cycles, and it has no bottom at all. Mm-hmm. Perfect for hi-hat. Yeah. Perfect for acoustic guitar. You know, so I'll use those techniques because I'm not going to have a console. And, of course, a lot of these microphones have roll-offs, so you can roll off the bottom end if you don't want the uh, something from, like, too much bass yeah. or something to get in. So oh, I do want to ask you about, like, the creative process of recording with the mics and everything. So, like, when you first started out, how did you learn what worked and what well, mics to get? Was it just boy, that's your early-on experience in yeah. Nashville? or Well... That was helpful, and I made trips back to Nashville, but I had a friend in Dallas. His name was Tommy Loy. He played jazz trumpet. Mm. He was also engineer at CRC Recording Studios. Uh, Tommy and I became very close friends. He was very generous with teaching me all kinds of things that I needed to know. Uh, Those people who remember when Tom Landry was the coach, and a little short, bald-headed guy would come out and play the trumpet for the Star Spangled Banner. That was Tommy Loy. Yeah. No, I've actually heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tommy was a great, great friend. And, um, uh, like I said, very generous with his information and help. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there, the thing that most young kids would have a lot of trouble understanding is that back when I started... You couldn't go out and buy a headphone box, for instance. You went down and you bought little mini boxes and you drilled holes and you mounted the controls and and you wired them up and you built them. In Mm -hmm. fact, my first console, I built. And I don't mean I bought somebody else's mic prees. I mean, I took metal boxes, drilled a hole for the transformer, drilled a hole for the mic, for the tube to go, the input, the output, went inside and... Do you, put, still, do you still have that? I do I'd have it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it out <laughs> and photograph up close some of the parts one of these days and put yeah. it on my website. I'm, uh, I'm starting a new Facebook page for Robin Hood Studios. It'll be ready in a few days. Yeah, no, I'm, I'll link it and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, you just, for instance, a direct, a direct hookup from an amp mm-hmm. to, a, to a mic, they didn't make those. They didn't even make a direct hookup for an instrument. Yeah. I had to so, get transformers. So you had to be an actual engineer. You had to, <laughs> to, yeah, you had to build stuff. Yeah. You know. And uh, it was really kind of wild, uh, I'll have to say. that. But, you know, you flow with the times. Uh, digital is, I wouldn't go back to recording on tape if I could. Yeah. Because it was... It was really a lot. So of, you're not you're not one of the purists who records on no. analog and then converts it to digital. No, 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 not yeah. I. Uh, yeah, let me take just a short break, okay? You want no, to cut that no off? No problem. No problem. Yeah. You ready to keep going? Yeah. 
Yeah. Ask me another question. So, <clears throat> you, you mentioned it briefly. Uh, so, what what about the changeover to digital? When did you do that? Well, the first thing I did was start uh, mixing mm -hmm. to a computer. And uh, then, you know, that was two-track editing and mastering and such as that. And then uh, I finally decided to go all the way and do it. And, you know, here's the deal. Pro Tools started when computers didn't have the power yeah. to do the processing. And so they manufactured these huge DSPs. And that's where the work was done, not in the computer. And those were expensive. So that meant the major labels people like that, studios, they went with Pro Tools. But I just didn't have a clientele at the time that I felt could support what I'd have to spend on Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I went with New Window. Now, it's made by Steinberg, which is now owned by Yamaha. New Window was re really started, of course, they owned Cubase, too. A lot of people use Cubase for, for music. Mm -hmm. New Window was really intended more for film because it's massive, they've got, uh, it's expensive, they've got incredible plugins, and uh, I love it, it's easy to use. Um, one of my interns here, a guy named Grant, uh, he came here, he learned on Nuendo, uh, he decided he wanted to go to Belmont. Well, they require that you know how to use Pro Tools. So he bought a Pro Tools Lite and he started, he came back and he said, oh my goodness, what a mess. He said, I, 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 I'd much rather work in New Window. It's, it makes sense. It's easy. You know? Yeah. Uh, so when I went to, to, to New Window, a friend of mine named Bob Gentry, who's a great bass player, traveled with Tom Jones. He's got a nice studio. You ought to interview him sometime. But Bob uh, came over. And my son had built the computer and we, we loaded it up. And he sat there for two hours one Sunday afternoon and gave me lessons. Nine o'clock the next morning, I booted up and did a session by myself. That's how easy it is to use. Yeah. Um, very few programs. Very few programs are that easy. Um, you know, talking about the sound, Nuendo, from the very beginning, could record at 48K 32-bit float which that gives you a little protection mm -hmm. from overload. And uh, I loved it. Uh, I think a few months ago, Pro Tools finally added the capability of 32-bit float. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's fast. It's great to be able to look up on the screen and see the level you're putting, actually putting mm -hmm. on a track. Um, and it's like an x-ray, too. Because when you're looking at a waveform, it's like a doctor studying a, a, an x-ray. You can see a pop. Somebody yeah. pops a mic. Boy, there it is. You can see it, you know. And you can know, get up there and take it out. Um, as far as the sound is concerned, I'm starting with some, you know, tube microphones and, and vintage, you know, FET microphones. I'm going into classic mic pre's. The API to me is is the sound. Mm -hmm. And Neve put out an, a new mic pre. Actually, it's Rupert Neve. They they were based here in Texas, not the company out of England. It's the most interesting Neve mic pre I've ever heard. I've produced on Neve consoles all over the country, uh, L.A., several studios in L.A., Dallas, Houston. Nashville, Toronto, New York. I mean, I've, I've, I'm very familiar with the Neve, and they're, they're great sounding consoles, and they're very clean. But I always considered the mic pre's to be a little bit boring. Yeah. They were, they were so clean. They were a little, so sterile. Uh, yeah, a yeah. little sterile. But the new Portico mic pre that was built here in Texas by the uh, Rupert Neves company, those are sweet. They, I love to put those on overheads for drums. They're just, and it's got a button you can push called Silk. And Silk adds the vintage 
sound, mm. the harmonics that they add. I don't even have to do that. They just they just sound cool. Yeah. Just the way they are. Um, and editing, of course, golly, what we can do now, <laughs> editing. You, you do it. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. Um, Save a lot on tape, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm really fond of my Waves plugins. Yeah. Waves has got a thing called the Wave Tune, and I can do anything from the the robotic kind of stuff you hear on certain records to just very casual stuff that you can't tell it's been tuned. That's to me. That's the best tuning when you tune somebody up and nobody can tell it's been touched. It just sounds like they did it perfectly. That you know, that's the paradigm. That's yeah. what we're looking for. Yeah. Um, New Window has some gates in their plugins. There's a guy in Nashville I really, really love. He's a great guy. He's called Ed C. S E A Y. Ed uh, works at a place up there called Loud Studios. He's mostly doing mixing and mastering, but he also tracks. We've used him quite a bit, and he's just a really neat guy. He also teaches the Primo course at Belmont University, um, which is engineering mm -hmm. he and i used to go back and forth back and forth trying to find a gate that we could use to gate tom toms kick and snare it's just quieting them down so instead and all that trash in the background with tom tom you get boom and it would be quiet until that tom tom was hit again mm -hmm. boom boom and it was clean we had to go in and edit literally just cut out everything in between took like an hour to edit one song. Well, I discovered a little gate that Nuendo has. I can I can gate the toms, the kick, whatever. Leaves them just like they are, except gets out of the way, all the other trash. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, mean, I guess I've lived long enough to see more change than most people. Um, I've said about the younger generation, if it doesn't come out of their phone, they have no idea what you're talking about. I can remember when my son was a kid, just a young kid, the, the, the phrase was, if you've got a problem with your computer, call a 14-year-old kid. He'll help you with it. <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, a lot of the young kids today, and I don't mean 14, but I mean the you know high school, they don't know that much about computers. Mm -hmm. They do so much with their phone. And I'll give them credit. They can do a lot that I can't do. But they don't watch news on, t on television. They don't know what knows news is true or false. Because they sure don't watch a diff different array of channels to find mm -hmm. out who's lying and who's not. They don't, I mean, the schools have denied them so much information about so many important things. Uh, they don't know anything about World War II. They don't know why it happened. They don't know who Neville Chamberlain was. They've never heard of the treaty that he got signed with Adolf Hitler that said, there will be peace in our time. Well, if you want to research the peace he was talking about, just go Google World War II, and that's what they got for yeah. that signature. Um, they don't know what to do a lot. Of, they're starting to learn politically just on gut instinct on what things are happening today. But technically, um, they can sit there and do things with their phone, like edit. I mean, they can edit pictures and edit audio and all kind of stuff. So um, I will say that it's very base level stuff. <laughs> you, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't do it to your specifications on a phone. No, no. <laughs> but you can, you can get with a preset for you to do. Right. It. Yeah. You can. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know. I've lived long enough that, you know, I wasn't back when they had one mic in the middle of the room and everybody ganged around. But, mm. but still, um, I was there when I, when I remember building the studio. In fact, as soon as this interview is over, I'm going to back, have to go in and put together sub-D cables, 25 a conductor going over to Mike Prees, mm -hmm. the to be the input cables into my 32 track converter. I bought a, I bought a beautiful 32 track converter 
But uh, it's, it's uh, and there I am. I'm going to be soldering wires just like I did when I started this, you know, in 1963. So, uh, you know, any advice I would give people today is, you know, people will tell you, do what your heart tells you to do. Do what you love doing. Well, it's good to do what you love doing if you're good at it. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, being in the studio business where you lease the studio to everybody who walks through the door. You know, I've had cases where I just say, wow, this person ought to be a star. They're good. They're mm -hmm. great. Uh, and I've had cases where somebody wanted to be a star so badly. And, you know, God didn't program them that way. Yeah. Um, had a little girl call me one time from, I think, Henderson, Texas. First words out of her mouth, I'm better than Leanne Rimes. I said, well, you're going to have to be pretty good because <laughs> her nickname is O.T. And she said, what does O.T. stand for? I said, one take. Yeah. You know? And uh, she came over, and the sad truth was that she was tone deaf mm -hmm. and had no sense of rhythm. She had been singing along with the, with the, with the track that had the original singer on it. Yeah. And because she could sing along with that, she thought she was a singer. Mm -hmm. And the sad part about it is she told me, she said, I promised my daddy on his deathbed that I would be a singer. And I said, well, sweetheart, uh, he's going to be okay with it. You know, yeah. you're, it's, <laughs> it's not, it, you know. I hate to tell anybody it's not going to happen, but you can't yeah. fix tone deaf yeah. and you can't fix no rhythm. So, but this has been a long ride. It's been a fun ride. I've seen, you know, it's, it's interesting as the way you're talking about the digital and all, it's interesting to see that certain things like that mic hanging over there. That's a, that's an AKG C12 original. I mean, they only made 2,000 of them back in the 60s. Yeah. And I don't know what it's worth. Maybe 10 grand or whatever you can get for it, <laughs> well, you know. But I saw a video on it. It's worth more than that. It is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, whatever. Um, but it's, it's amazing how those pieces of equipment are still state-of-the-art and the best you can get. Yeah. While on the other end, for the recording and all the – editing and producing and all that we go to the other end of the spectrum we go to the digital mm -hmm. and it it's a it's a nice combination yeah it really is sure in fact is. these microphones uh, they sound better than a lot of the microphones did back in the 60s that were pretty doggone expensive yeah I'm not going to tell you how much I paid for these because it I'd doesn't be too matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. No, I'm familiar with it. I know. Yeah. 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 But, but that's good because it allows people like you to go out and do these things and get a good sound. Yeah. It's like your camera, you know. I mean, I just bought a while back a, a little uh, professional video camera. It's a Canon. Mm -hmm. uh, the most amazing two things about it on the side here, you stick those little uh, SD cards in there. You can stick two in there, one terabyte each. Yeah. You now have two terabytes of of media on board. And the little lens, it goes from 29 degrees wide angle to 600 degrees telephoto. Yeah. Now, that's amazing. Yeah. And it's not this long. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But I've no, done no. a lot of remodeling in the studio, changing things. Um, one of the biggest changes I made acoustically was about law 25, 30 years ago. We had been using um, uh, fiberglass mm -hmm. for uh, insulation, for sound insulation. Well, the OSHA required that companies that have these metal buildings with a shop in it, and then you have a little thin wall with an office, they demanded that that office be down at a certain sound level. And so a company... Called, built something called thermofiber sound attenuation blanket. Four inches of that will stop more hundred cycles than four feet of fiberglass. So we added a lot of that, and it did improve the acoustics. Of course, I didn't even have, 
I had concrete floors here at first. Then I added the carpet on half of it and, and this hardwood because I love hardwood, you know. Yeah. It, it gives you that nice live sound. Uh, but it's been, been quite a ride. So let, let me ask you, you said you're writing a book. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm going very slowly, you're unfortunately, very right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, is it just uh, about your life? Is it? It's basically about studio. Yeah. Yeah. It's about. Uh, in fact, I've just changed the name of the book. I was going to call it Twenty Two Hundred Sunnybrook, because that's the address nobody can find. <laughs> on on my new uh, Facebook page, this wonderful lady is helping me with it, and I told her. I took a picture of that green door with 2200 on I said, let's put that on there. Yeah. So, oh, there's that door, you know. But, um, you know, it's, um, I look back at it as, I look back at it as the trip. You know, the book is, is about the trip, about what mm-hmm. happened along the way. Um you know, I'm in a business where there are a lot of disappointments. You know, you get close, this is going to be a hit record, yeah, yeah, boom, nothing happens. I mean, we've all had that happen. Uh, everybody thinks they've had more than their share, and I do, believe me. Um, but, um, you know, my mother helped me run the studio until she passed. And, boy, she did the, she did the books. She booked sessions. She uh, uh, made coffee. She clean, helped clean up the place. We had a maid named Lily Mae Amos. She was a fun lady, blessed Christian lady. And, uh, you know, it, I was running scared when it first started. Yeah. I really was. And uh, then I married a beautiful lady from St. Martinville, Louisiana. Managed to talk her into moving up here. <laughs> And that has been the stabilizing factor in my life since then. Yeah. We have two wonderful children. They have, I have now five grandkids. Four years ago, I didn't have any. Now I've got five. Uh, How much longer do I want to do this? People ask. I don't know. Um, I guess it depends on my health and whatever other issues may pop up. Yeah. Well, man, I, th- I think you've had a life well lived. Well, <laughs> even if you so stopped, far so good. Even if you stopped now, man, you got family. You've got an incredible career. Well, it's uh, it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. This has been great. Oh, hey there! Look at you. You made it to the end. You're a pretty unordinary person yourself. Most people don't do that. Uh, while you're here, why don't you like and subscribe, or follow, or whatever it is, and... Oh, also, we're on Instagram and Facebook, so you should probably go check those out, too. Thanks for listening. You're pretty cool.